What's up, guys? Doug Polk here, and I'm joined by Nick Petrangelo. Welcome, man. Good to have you in the vid today. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good to be here. I'm excited to go over some hands with you. Okay, so let's talk about what we're doing today. Uh, this is the last day of the open cart period for our new course, Winning Poker Tournaments. Uh, and so today we're going to go through and give you a little sampling of uh, you know, what it's like to learn from Nick, and we're going to discuss some spots. Uh, if you are an alumni of the prior tournament masterclass, you get a $300 discount. If not, the course will be $1,000. Um, but if you're not interested in the course, that's totally fine. Hopefully, we can give you some good information to improve your poker game here right today for free, which uh, is a pretty good price, too. So uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it here with our first hand. We've got four hands Nick recently played in a $2,000 online tournament that he won, and we're going to look at uh, some of the most interesting hands from that tournament and uh, take it from there. Sound good, Nick? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. All right, uh, so you want to maybe talk a little bit about this tournament. Uh, it, it's a 2K round, Stars. Yeah, so this was a 2K I played on a Sunday during WCOOP. Uh, I played a decent amount of uh, volume during WCOOP, and... I always tack this two, Sunday 2K high roller on to uh, whatever schedule I'm playing. It's sort of a smaller field, tougher tournament, um, but it's a fun one. It starts really deep. And what we're looking at here is the final two tables approaching the bubble uh, with a bunch of tough regs. And we've got a, probably about 17 left here as there's a missing seat. So it's 17 or 16 left. And... The min cash is 5K for a 2K buy-in, so a two and a half buy-in uh, min cash. I'm one of the chip leaders, and this hand actually happens against another one of the big stacks. So, yeah, there's some prize pool considerations here, some interesting stuff. So I think it's uh, some good spots here. And then as we move on, the other spots are from the final table. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Let's jump right in here with our first hand. So uh, under the gun min raise. We decide two, three bet in the small. But let's actually let's actually pause before we we show decisions for for the vid. Yeah. Um, so what are your thoughts here? I, and, and this is a spot that you know I, I just think about when I've played a lot of tournaments in these types of situations. It it kind of sucks, right? Because uh, there are just so many players left behind you to act, particularly some of these short stacks, that uh, you you really have to kind of decide the way that you're going to play your range and. And I feel like there are very few hands that we would want to be flatting in this in this instance. Um, what, what's your breakdown of, of flat to three bet here when you decide to play? Yeah, I think you're exactly right about that. I think um, you're, there's another factor, too, that the big blind is very short, the small blind is very short, which the short big blind around the bubble isn't stealing as much of our equity as it would normally, but obviously letting him in there and us playing a three-way pot with King Jack suited is slightly worse um, than it would be if he was at like 50 effective, right? So that's a consideration. We probably want to shut him out with all of his very easy, very profitable overhauls, uh, especially for a min raise. So, you know, like I said, it's not really... He's, he shouldn't be that tight because the bubble's coming up because it's still like 17 left, 11 cash, and he's by far in last place. So he's probably going to overcall pretty wide, and then you know we're going to have lower equity in the pot than we do if it goes multi-way with a deeper stack. But in general, I think with this many ranges behind you, you want to be three-betting a ton just because, like I said, you know you, we lose a lot of equity multi-way, even with a hand like this, uh, even with our suited aces. So... We want to play a really substantial three bet strategy and we want to actually size down a little bit because we're pretty linear as opposed to being, um, you know, like button versus hijack or something like that where we're, we're three betting. Uh, we can do a little bit of bigger size because we have fewer ranges behind us and because we're uh, versus a wider range versus this tight range where we're pretty tight too. I think we should use a pretty, you know, a little bit smaller size three bet a lot of our hands that we're playing and there's not really going to be any pure calls here i think every hand that we want to enter the pot with here we're going to have some three bet frequency with um and when we're playing for chips i think this one should be about 50 percent. and then when you consider that we're in a bit of an icm spot against another chip leader sure maybe my frequency goes down a little bit but at this point um i'm happy to play more chippy v focus strategy and not really worry about you know letting the chip leader on my right take all the pots uh, i still think there's a lot of equity in playing aggressive versus him now so yeah 
That makes a lot of sense. Uh, all, okay, gotcha. So that, that makes a lot of sense. The, the thing in this situation that, that I like to think about as you approach the bubble is it, it's very different if you're like one or two off the bubble um, when we're looking at spots between two of like the bigger stacks uh, in the tournament. Uh, it's very different because when you're like one or two at the bubble versus being like you know four or five off the bubble, because it, in a scenario where you double up through this guy, he's in a you know not very good situation. He's he's very likely to no longer cash, and so even though yes he eliminates you if you get all in and he stacks you, uh, I still do think you have a lot of pressure on him to not get stacked. Whereas that might change as you get you know one off the bubble or something, um, then he's much more likely to cash given some of the these really small stacks. Yeah, I do think that it's definitely overdone um, letting someone that covers you sort of dictate your strategy. Uh, for one thing that I would say that's a pretty general rule is in order for him to be an absolute savage with aggression versus you, especially out of position, he needs to have a much bigger chip lead than he does now. Um, you know, like that that range of having a chip lead that allows you to just run people over is more in like the 1.5x, 2x chip lead range. When we're this close, he still has to be very cautious for the reasons that you said, if we're talking about playing under the strict rules of the ICM model. But I'm not a huge fan of subscribing to it so wholly because it is based on the fact that the tournament's going to end the next hand and we just get to like cash out the value of our stacks, which of course, under that scenario, we wouldn't want to engage each other because we have a lot of value locked up. But we still have to play for this prize pool and the the payout increases are really meaningful. Like we're not in a satellite or something where we're like playing for one seat that we want to get locked up and we have a bunch of chips. We're going to, 11th place here is 5K and 7th place is 8K. So there's not much money to be made from putting myself in a position to go from 11th to 7th, but I can gain a lot of EV by playing really aggressively and being in a spot to finish top three and playing against another chip leader that I think might be opening loose because he thinks there's ICM pressure is probably a pretty good strategy for me. All makes sense. So we decided to go uh, 15,000 here. Yeah, like I said, on the smaller side because of all the ranges behind us, you don't want to be dumping in a big three bet with a bunch of short stacks behind you that are just going to jam if they wake up with something. So yes, it, it would be quite the dump if they if they decide to go with it behind. Um, back over to this guy. Okay, so now so now this is getting kind of interesting. Now we see a four bet, and a lot of the stuff that we talked about a little earlier is starting to come into play. Right, we're starting to see. Um, now he wants to try and be aggressive against us, un understanding some of the ICM implications. Uh, but again, he's not in that 1.5 to 2x spot that you talked about a little earlier. Yeah, and I think that also, like, what in in the ICM scenarios, like, what he wants to do here with some stuff like ace queen off or like jacks or ace king at equilibrium is just shove. Like, I have 75 blinds; it's not too much to shove. And that part of the ICM factor is definitely a thing where, like, yeah, I don't want to call it off for my tournament life here. But for this smallish, not smallish, I mean, it's a normal size. It's just over 2.5x, which is kind of what we expect in this spot. Um, first of all, what his range looks like a little bit, I think it's probably a little bit looser than normal because of the illusion of the pressure. And I think that that means something like a little bit of ace-5 suited, maybe a little bit of ace-10 suited. And then maybe he's jamming jacks and four betting a little bit and mostly calling them and then four betting queens plus and ace king suited and ace king off sometimes. Ace king off should be mixing a lot of jams and some four bets and, and probably not too many calls at 75, but a little bit. Uh, so versus that range, I get to pure call this hand. I get to pure call king 10 suited, king queen suited, ace 10 suited plus and I'm folding queen jack suited, which I probably would have put this three bet in, but I will have some frequency with, because of the way the stacks are with like sixes plus and increasing as the pair goes up. And when I have like sixes through tens, I'm gonna pure call this and I'm gonna have pretty decent frequencies with those hands because I'm gonna V pip them and calling is kind of weak with the stack distribution behind me. Um, and those are really good hands to put a three bet in here because when I call versus the other chip leader, and flop a set, you know, I win a massive pot. There's a lot of future EV in that play. So my range is going to look like a lot of those pairs, a lot of suited broadways, my suited aces that I did decide to do this with, which would be ace-5 through ace-3 and ace-9 suited plus, mostly ace-10 suited plus, and ace-queen off, ace-king off. <clears throat> I'll probably jam ace-king off sometimes and flat it sometimes. 
Uh, why, why are you deciding to fly out a hand like King Jack suited but fold Queen Jack suited? You know, when I, when I think about those hands, I, I think that would probably be mixing in both into my call range. Is there a particular reason why you think that it would be a fold? Yeah, I think that that's just the pip right there because he is going to, um, like, kings have that additional equity versus queens. It's just, like, a really meaningful pip when you consider his four betting range. It's it's that close that, like, you don't continue with uh, the unders to the pairs that he four bets at a very high frequency. Um, also, like, with the queen-jack suited, you're dominated by his a little bit lighter, like, ace-queen, ace-queen suited. Um, and you're still you're live against ace-king off, which should be jamming a lot. And so you're actually dominated by more hands with the queen jack suited to the point where I think you got to start with your king x suited broadways and fold the, the queen x. Okay. All makes sense. All right. We decided to call. We get, we get a money flop here. 10, 8, 3 rainbow. So this is a spot where we should expect the big size from him a lot. Um, if you think about what we just said about the ranges, he, he should have like half of his range should be over pairs. Um, and when I'm going to three bet a lot of those pairs and continue versus him and have some of the, some of my weakest hands, like this hand that has like 15% equity versus that range or whatever. Um, he's actually letting me realize almost that with this bet size with like my weakest, you know, the ace jack suited, the king jack suited, the king queen suited. Um, I should actually fold this a bunch and call just a little bit with the back doors and then full, pure fold, like obviously the diamonds. Um, but the king queen, king jack suited probably gets to call like 20% of each suit. And I shouldn't really face this small size a lot. So I think when I face the small size, in addition to like the small size pre flop, I kind of get to peel and just take advantage of population tendencies here where. Maybe if he has, like, ace-4 suited, he just doesn't want to put in that, like, big C-bet. But when he has, like, queens, I think it's pretty intuitive that you should face the big size. And then when he has, like, jacks plus, if we get a brick on the turn, we probably expect him to continue forcing money in the pot with most of his range and then just check his ace highs sometimes and sometimes with jacks. So I think we can take one off here when we face the small size, but like I said, we should be folding like three quarters of the time with each suit and just continuing a bit. That makes sense to me, and, and it gives us some some pretty good bluff candidates on later streets. It's nice to just have some, you know, on a board like this. How many draws do we really have, right? Obviously, if we're folding queen jack suited, we're not going to have jack nine suited. We're not going to have a bunch of these holdings, so. We're gonna have to float some some weaker hands, and the only candidates that seem you know a, as good are maybe some of like the ace king ace queen hands where we block a bunch of their value range. Yeah. Um, so With ace king, yeah, sorry, ace king, we're, we're we don't have it as much, also, right? So. Right. That also makes sense. Okay, so we do decide to call. Yeah, I went for the call. <clears throat> Here's where we expect. Uh, it, a lot of over pairs actually kind of have like a mandatory, you know, like queens. You really don't want to let your opponent realize with something like ace jack suited. Uh, they do have to just put in money when they have a flush draw. You can do some really weird stuff here in these three bet pots out of position where you just bet like a medium size actually. And then with like ace king and uh, you know your pot pairs like betting like fifty or sixty percent pot here is fine. And then with the ace king that doesn't block the club draw, you can just call it off and you fold the other ones. And it puts me in a tough spot when I have stuff like jacks. You know, I can't just pure get it in there. And when I have stuff like you know my ace ten suited or king ten suited, I don't know. It makes it, it makes it really tough when I don't have uh, the club. So, so uh, wait, you like like a a fifty sixty k bet from Masari is what you're saying here, right? Uh, like a fifty or sixty percent pot. Like the the block bet is too. There's some spots where the block bet's really good here, but out of position here, I don't think you get to block on a turn that's kind of this wettish versus my continue range you have a lot of protection issues um when your block doesn't really accomplish as much as you would like it to against my range so i think that if you're going to bet you want to bet like greater than 50 percent pot and you're going to mix in some ace king bet folds which is kind of weird but you're also gonna 
make, get some immediate protection and some immediate folds from my pairs that aren't in that bad of shape. And um, you're going to get another call from stuff like King 10 or, or Jack 10 or, or uh, Jack 10 suited, maybe Ace 10 suited, obviously, that blocks the aces. So he can play a jam here for a small frequency. He can play like a 60% pot that's effectively a jam that lets him fold the weakest ace kings and call the call off the one that doesn't block my uh, flush draw jam. And you expect him to do like checking with his ace high bluffs, checking with his ace king that he decides not to use that strategy with, which is going to happen quite often too, checking with his ace five suited that's not clubs. So when he checks here, it's going to be a little bit of jacks, a little bit of kings, not really that much slow playing here because I have like pot to play. And when he checks, yeah, we expect him to have ace high a bunch and uh, some of the like the weakest over pair jacks that doesn't gain as much from going for it as queens and kings do. I also would think Jax is going to four bet less here pre flop given the given the situation. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I agree. Um, so. How are we planning on playing our range here then? What are we looking to bet in the turn versus check, and how are you constructing that? I think that I made a mistake here um, because of the way I said the range is. I, I should just put out a quarter pot bet, maybe 30% pot bet, and just make his you know random bluffs with the ace X suited or random low frequency ace jack or you know ace queen or his pretty high frequency ace king suited that you know like you know his uh spades hearts diamonds have to fold so i think that i can accomplish a lot with just a really small bet here and get the immediate folds from the hands that i want to fold and then shove on bricks like you know half or two-thirds of the time um as opposed in the in game what i was thinking was when he checks here if he checks twice on a lot of runouts, then I have a ton of visibility and I can just jam and he's going to have a really hard time. Uh, even if he kind of like knows my strategy space up, he can't call with ace king. And I thought that that might be, keep in mind still, I do have, I'm not playing, there's basically a 0% raise for my range versus four bet, right? So like I have everything, which is why I can do the 25 or 30% turn bet. I have aces and kings. I'm just a little bit wider than him, um, so that that's my issue, but not much. We're running kind of close. Like, on the flop, he should be 60-40, but once he C-bets and I call, we're running really close, and I can take advantage of that with a small bet. So you're saying small bet with almost all of your hands? Uh, yeah, I think I get to put in, well, I would check, like, my hands that have some additional equity. Like I said, like my sevens and my nines, they're going to bet less often, um, but still have some frequency, but... It's okay to let him pull at a six outer now. Um, I'm fine with that as opposed to because he still should have a check jam range with some of his uh, like ace king of clubs. Uh, he'll probably do that like half the time. So it's kind of really bad for me to bet nines and fold to that jam when I can just check back. So I get to do a protection bet with those hands sometimes. I get to put in the bet call with my better hands that I have at like full frequency with this line, which is, you know, Queens, kings, aces, tens, eights, sixes sometimes, lower frequency than the others, but they're still in there. So if you play this small three-bet strategy pre-flop, then you're in a pretty good spot to put out the small bet, and you're pretty well protected. Gotcha. Yeah, and if you if you use the small bet too often, um, or if you started to bet small with almost your entire range or, or the vast majority of your range, then out of position, the value of checking with your good hands goes up, right? So... You, you also want to you, you want to dissuade him from that being too attractive of an option right which is you're gonna use that's why yeah you're gonna use your um, your nines and uh, your your sevens for to check back a lot there and still have some pairs and still have some straights when it goes check check and, and you're also gonna have a bunch of the club combos are gonna be your highest frequency checks there so like if I had king jack of clubs I'd almost always check. So that's going to protect you too when it goes when it goes check check and you're going to have some strong hands there. Yeah, that's a hand that particularly suffers. Uh, yeah, exactly. decide to, yeah, yeah. Like we don't care about we have like no equity in this pot with the king jack. We don't care about 
bet folding, which is why I think this is like a pretty bad decision by me um, to do that, but it's fine. But definitely, I would highly prefer betting small here. All right, so now we face a river check. What, what size do you think makes the most sense here? When it goes check, check there, now I think I have to just take advantage of the fact that for one, he, so like, I think in any, in, posi- in position, it's not really, I don't construct ranges in position that have smaller than 50%, um, because the like block size bet is mostly a function of being out of position and trying to, you're using hands that you would often prefer to check to make a small bet, um, but you're out of position and you don't want to check them. So like in position, it doesn't really make sense to have that sort of block betting range because it's not really what the function of the bet size is uh, because it's mostly born from being out of position. So when I'm in position, I my smallest bet size is 50% here. So I think with something with worse blockers, I could do maybe 50%, but I think my hand is pretty decent. Like, I don't, like, jacks and kings, I think, are pretty high up there in terms of hands that he might do this with, jacks being the, the most often post flop. Um, but really, I think, even if we're not thinking about cards and we just get out of solver world for a minute, like, people just don't take this line with a strong hand and at that point when I just decide that I'd rather just put max pressure and also take a line that a lot of people don't take as bluffs in tournaments like I think that the general population tendency here is to to think that you know I'm doing something tricky more often than I'm doing something aggressive trying to take the pot um, with a light holding when I check back the turn there especially when I do have like aces and kings in my pre flop range I think that maybe I get more credit for a pot size bet, pot size shove here when I do have pot size left than I do for a half pot that might get some calls from ace high. Whereas when I full potted, I think ace kings, ace king and ace queen are just pure folding, and that's what I'm going for. Does it change how much you're going to bluff here, given that if he calls, you are eliminated from the tournament, or are we not close enough to the, to the bubble to consider that? Because I guess that's one of the main reasons why people might choose to go with a half pot size here is to, you know, protect the, their more valuable chips being their last ones. I think at this point, when I win this pot, I am going to have almost that magic chip lead on these guys where I get to play crazy on the bubble and the future EV of that. Because, um, like I said, against this line, I do think it's going to get through a huge percentage of the time, right? Like, It went from pre-flop half of his hands being ace high and now he took this line post-flop so like if we already started at 50 50 and i'm shoving for pot and i'm getting pure folds from ace high i think i'm in a really good spot here uh so given given that you win this tournament i'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that this gets through he called with queen jack and i had the huge chip uh all right yeah so i think that um yeah, like I said, also, there's no, it's pretty flat there um, from 11th to like even 6th. You're not, you're making like five buy ins for that many jumps, and we have 17 left. And first is 20 buy ins. So, yeah, I think when I get in that spot post flop, like I said, it's, it was already low frequency. So I'm not having like a huge issue when I go for it there because it's not like I'm getting in that spot every time I have that King Jack. I should be folding the flop a lot. I should be. Making a small yeah. bet on the turn a lot, so. That all makes sense. All right, next hand, we open ace-queen. Gets around to the small blind. Face a 4x3 yeah. bet. So, yeah, I'm... This, uh, this is kind of awkward. This is kind of an awkward spot. This is a weird spot. So, we've got Bartek, short. This is where, you know, like some of the... This is now where this is the final five of the tournament. So fifth is 11, fourth is 18. So we're getting a um, couple of, you know, three and a half buy-ins there. And so there's a three and a half buy-in jump now. And the jump from fifth to third is 10 buy-ins. I mean, uh, five buy-ins, sorry, 10K. 
So these are kind of meaningful jumps here because if I just outlast Bartek and Fish, I'm, I'm making five buy-ins. And with the way the distribution is, um, and the chip leader, chip leader was a tough regular, but the second place was sort of a guy that I hadn't seen play before. So I assumed he was a newer player coming in for W Coop. Um, so yeah, this is a spot where busting the Igor is actually pretty costly because the middle stacks. To put it like to not get way too way too far into the ICM thing, the middle stacks should be pretty passive against each other right now because C Darwin has almost twice as many chips as I do, and you know me doubling up puts me even with him, right? And the other guy has five thirty one. So it's not like if I double up here, I'm in a hugely different scenario where I'm winning the tournament a ton more, you know, um, right. because the other guys do have chips. So I know I know Igor is pretty levelly. He's pretty smart. He's pretty tricky, and he's pretty rich. So I thought uh, he was probably maybe more likely to put a little leverage on me here when I min raise under the gun into the unknown stack um, under the gun five. So you know. <clears throat> hijack. Uh, or, well, we're, we're, we're six handed here, I think. So. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah. Tricky spot. I think that I can jam this some frequency. It's a hand that benefits a lot from jamming, but calling is really good. And if he's bluffing, I'm going to dominate his bluffs really often. He's almost always going to be using an ace X or like a king queen or like a, a queen nine suited to bluff here. Those are really good candidates. So I think the call is better for those reasons. Yeah, and, and that's really the question, right? The question is not even um, does call or jam, does one of them make money? It's a comparison. You have to contrast them and figure out what, you know, what frequency makes sense to the one that makes you more money more often. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, like when I think of ace-queen, it, it is a nice hand to be able to jam um, on stack sizes, maybe like even a little shorter than this, I would say. Uh, and it, it does get a lot of value from um, – you know, just taking the pot down and preventing your opponent from realizing their equity. But you are in position here. Uh, I, I think the stack size, the the SPR is going to be somewhat favorable for us post flop. Um, when we do, you know, hit an ace or queen, we can we're going to easily be able to stack off profitably in those situations. Um, so yeah, I, I think I like I think I like the decision to flat here. Yeah, I like it. Um, the way we would figure it out really in depth, like, is you try to compare, you try to figure out what your average outcome with the call is and with the, with the uh, jam is, and then figure out how much those chips are worth in the prize pool. But like I said, I don't think that we really need to get caught up in that because that model does, so he that that model does assume have some rigid assumptions that aren't that realistic. Um, so now on this board, when he checks to me, I think that I do have, I'm calling, I'm opening and calling probably fives plus and a bunch of suited aces and nine, 10 suited. I don't think I'm allowed to fold to that pre-flop. Um, there is the added benefit of making these calls in position for me that we're supposed to be passive against each other post-flop and if he does have a hand like ace king, I'm gonna get to showdown more often. And so I don't think I have to be tight enough pre where I don't have a lot of strong hands here. And I definitely have every set. I probably shove jacks sometimes and call sometimes. Uh, so yeah, I think I'm doing fine on this board, but I think check, I think going for a bet fold, I think my hand's a little bit too good when I can check and sort of go to showdown. I do have like backdoor nut straight draws and yeah, I have too much, probably right on the borderline of too much equity to go for a bet and just get blown off my hand by a check raise by something, you know, like if he did make this move with like queen nine of clubs or if he just has a suited ace or uh, if he's going for a check raise with just queens or whatever. Is there a difference in your mind if one of your cards is a diamond here? I think I just check more often because it makes that conversation easier when we're talking about how much equity we're bet folding as opposed to just checking down when we're supposed to be passive against each other anyway. Makes sense. Yeah. And also it's not like I get to bet and use that blocker like it's something meaningful when our SPR is so low and he still has to just stack off when it's like a low, if he check calls with a slow play and it's like a low diamond and he just decided to check call the flop with kings or 
King Jack suited or whatever he had pre. It's not like I get to just blow him off that because I have a diamond blocker um, because it's not like he can only stack off with a flush when we started the hand with 50 blinds and we already put in so much pre. So we do decide to go ahead and bet here. Yeah, I don't like it so much. As you can tell, I'm not doing the uh, explaining my what I actually did because I already made two mistakes in my opinion. So. <laughs> Especially funny when you get you get to choose the hands, so that that makes it even better. Well, just choose the biggest pots. We wanted to have some there you go discussion here. Yeah. So 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 one fifth pot. What do you think about the bet size you used here? I like the bet size, um, just because I don't think I need when he's light. He will have some of those ace highs, like the ace five suited, ace four suited, even though I, I like to call those, a lot of people use them. And then he's going to have some of his king queen offs, his, uh, you know, ace ten off or whatever that they, they will pick up some equity and bump, blow me off on the turn with some of my range. I also have, a like I said, anytime you do have such a strong range on a board, like I have everything here, you can leverage that with small bet sizing with your range, especially in spots where... No matter what I have, if that's a strong hand, I can we're shallow enough where I can get all my chips in by the river. So starting with a small bet and benefiting the rest of my range by being protected with my small bet with my big hands, I really get to maximize my protection versus ace king with all those pocket pairs I have. And there's not much you can do about it at equilibrium to like blow me off because I still have everything else. It's it's another spot where with my pocket pairs, I'm playing like a pure call, um, with the exception of like Maybe something like tens and jacks at some frequency do benefit from a jam, but I don't really think he's bet, he's three bet calling nines here. So that kind of that equilibrium kind of goes out the window, and I start playing a pure call in position. So I think that anytime you have so many strong hands in your range and you're whatever you're relatively uncapped, you can use a small bet to benefit your whole range, and then just go from there when you can always get it in as you want in position as on future streets. But when we use this size, and um, as we discussed earlier, we shouldn't have too, too many hands betting here because we don't want to get blown off of our equity. Uh, doesn't this size allow us not much room to bluff? Because if we're using a really small size and can't bet that often, then what does the bluff frequency look like? Uh, I think that we do get to bluff. Like, if I had king high here i wouldn't i wouldn't have had any issues bluffing i was just saying like i don't like to bluff hands that have two overs and potentially can just win at showdown um but we do i think we you mean do we get to not bluff often on future streets or just on this street on this street yeah i think we do get to bluff often just like what i was saying is just because we do have so many pocket pairs that are good here and so many good jack x and so many good flush draws like if you think about our pre-flop range we still have the queen nine of diamonds every nine ten suited every king nine suited king ten suited ish probably king ten suited um not would, king nine suited would we want to bet a hand like ten nine suited because i think i would lean towards checking that i would check that one um but if we get it depends if he's using like if he's gonna go like 70 or just jam which i don't think he's just gonna jam so hands like that i don't think that it's that big of a deal because i don't think he's just gonna check jam stuff like queens right or he should be building a range that has like 70k in it um if he wants to even if he was check jamming queens yeah. that's not a terrible result for 10 nine suited <laughs> yeah true so yeah i think uh I think it's a bad bet with this hand, but with our range, we're fine. And like, if I had something like ace five of clubs, I'd be very happy to bet it. Makes some sense. All right. Check call, brick turn. Well, not really brick. We have backdoor flush draw, obviously. Some straight draws out there now. Yeah. Um, so like, I, I think when I see this situation, I'm really leaning towards checking this hand back on the turn. I just think we have so many other better bluffs. If we did bet 10-9, if we did bet backdoor clubs, if we did bet with diamonds, um, I'm probably okay betting with those hands. But the stack size is a little bit awkward. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that we're going to check a ton here. The biggest problem is when he does go for the check call there, 
it's so much more often a hand that had like like an ace king of clubs type uh, on the flop or like an ace 10 of clubs type or even an ace seven of club type. that's been, I think that when the fact that we don't have a diamond or a club in our hand is really an issue to put money in the pot here when we're getting so shallow and he actually will start check jamming stuff like that. And um, maybe if he did use like a five, six suited, that would be kind of like a prime check call hand on the flop. That would be a pretty out of line bluff in my opinion. But if he was going for it, it's a reasonable combo. Like, it would be fine. Um, six seven suited is also in there. Eight seven suited is also in there. The jack x check call pick pick up flush draws here. The king queen is suited check call pick up flush draws here. The queen ten suited etc. So like yeah, I think it really diminishes our equity versus range. It really decreases the chance that we get like you know a bet through here. Um, so yeah, I think it's a pretty bad turn compared to something like obviously the two of hearts might be something where we get to blow them off ace king a lot more often. The other thing is, uh, yeah, I just don't think that, I think he's gonna have pretty decent. I think that if he has like a random ace king holding, where there's a lot of runouts for us that are really credible when it goes check check and then we bet again. Given the flop size, that definitely makes sense. Like, like I think we're fine to rep a straight on a four or a nine or a ten or a queen when it goes, he check calls and then we check back the turn. Um, so yeah, I think that it's probably pretty good for our range because we just have so many hands that want to check back and we're going to be doing fine there with all our pocket pairs and our suited connectors. So on this river, it feels to me like we're going to want to use uh, two different sizes. We're going to want to have a, a small sub, uh, set of hands jam, given that we can have some jack X, uh, and we're definitely going to be able to have some flushes too. But we want to mainly, when we bet, probably go for a more half pot-ish type size because given the strategy on the flop, we can definitely have tens, nines, um, even a hand like sevens, I think, once this line is... Uh, taken, I think we're feeling somewhat confident in. So uh, I think I would probably mix between like a small subset of jams and then uh, a more common half potish bet size. What do you think about that? I agree. And also, I think that our specific hand ends up doing a really good job of eliminating combos of Jack X from his range. Um, like Ace Jack Off is a pretty prominent bluff candidate for him. But on top of that, he's, his queen-jack suited has to be now hearts or spades, and his ace-jack suited has to be now hearts. <clears throat> um, so hearts or, uh, yeah, what, what the fucking suit am I missing? Jesus Christ. Um, but so anyway, we we block his, his uh, suited jacks. We block his ace-jack off. And like you said, we have some credible value bets now, right? Like nines and tens would probably get to bet half pot here. And maybe, you know, get a call from an ace high or a lighter three bet, like a king eight suited type or an ace eight suited type or whatever. So in any case, yeah, I think that uh, we get to go for it, but not when we have a club. And also we do expect him to throw out some block bets if he did slow play some like if he has tens himself i think that's a tan that's like a prime block bet for him where he gets to bet 30 percent. so yeah we're feeling pretty confident that we can probably get him off this one a decent amount but i don't think we have showdown value and i don't think we get to check this one and i think it's pretty decent to bluff with how would you be selecting uh the bluff candidates for the larger size versus the smaller one i think if we have something like you know, even just the, the ace queen with the ace of clubs, because we don't really care that much about the suitedness of the ace jack because the frequency doesn't really change that much pre flop. So if we just have the, if we have fewer blockers to the to suited ace jack and then uh, more blockers to that nut flush, that's pretty good. Like I'd probably, if I got here with something like ace 10 with a club, um, I would shove there. Well, yeah. how how are you getting here with Ace Ten with a club? I don't think that's ever come up pretty, right? Um, 
I prob I'm that's probably very close calling for you. It depends how much we think Igor's bluffing, but yeah, maybe maybe my my threshold there is ace ace jack, but uh, probably you know ace queen with either club is pretty good. Ace of clubs being prioritized, and then probably some see some of the other hands that are like very good for bluffing. We probably would have continued bluffing on the turn, like yeah. So some of the king some of the king highs I'd probably bet the turn with. So I think I think we want to have the club blocker for the jam cuz any high, any high club blockers are going to get through. So I went with like medium medium biggish there. I'd well, probably like to see myself go smaller. Yeah, so so this this size strikes me as a little bit awkward, a little bit weird just because I don't feel like it's clearly in in line with the value hands that we're trying to represent. Like, if it's bigger, then it's kind of clear to me. It's like we're saying we either have a jack or a flush or some kind of trap. Um, And if it's smaller, you're saying that you can have some of these pair hands. Um, Yeah. It just just feels like a little bit bit off to me. I think we should go with the half pot here and just be like, make sure we get the – just – Rep the uh, the nines, tens, you know, maybe the very weirdly played queens is worth half pot too. But yeah, I agree. I think I think I was trying to go like a jack that doesn't have club blocker size, but that doesn't make sense. I think you. I think jacks are definitely just worth shoving here. So yeah, if I yeah if I have a jack, um, for sure. Okay. I don't know how much. Yeah, yeah. This was a quick one, actually. Yeah. Hi, Jack. Open. Button flat. Seems so, good. yeah, this is another one where it's pretty awkward with the stacks, but I think yeah, this this hand is one of the very few that we almost always want to call with. I like it. You know, one thing I, I did a lot of research on this spot when I analyzed some different samples of play. Uh, one thing that I always found players didn't do enough was play hands on the button. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously you need to think about like the, the blinds behind you. Um, like it's much better for you to play hands here with the huge stack and small blind, like the short guy and the big blind than vice versa. Right. But I've always seen like a lot of hands in the button have profitable win rates, certainly every pocket pair. Uh, and I just feel like a lot of players tend to play a little bit too tight in the button facing opens. Yeah, I think, you know, even regardless of ICM stuff, I should have a substantial flatting range here, even with a 10 big blind stack, just like a bunch of suited connectors, a bunch of suited kings, queen queen eight suited for sure, stuff like that. So, yeah, I think people are probably a little bit, a little bit too tight there. I agree. King eight seven, he checks. Yeah, I... Like we talked about, we should be pretty wide here, pre, which means we should build a substantial protection betting range. And we get to do that because we are flatting the sevens, the eights, the king five suited, probably king six suited for sure. And everything else like the nine, ten suited, jack ten suited. Like we've got a bunch of equity here. Our range when we flat the button is significantly tighter than his. Um, you know, he's probably opening something like 30, you know, the 10 big blinds, maybe like 30%. And then we're going to flat something like 12 or 15. So he's got to check to us here and kind of respect our range just because we're so much more condensed than him. So he has to do a lot of check folding. So we put in the protection size there. And then on this turn, I think the queen's pretty good for us because I don't, Obviously, like, he's not going to just check call, like, queen 10 and queen jack and queen 9, and we are going to bet those hands, and we are already starting tighter than him. In the first place, I think king queen goes for a check raise quite often um, on the flop from him when he, when, when he does induce that small bet from us. Uh, ace queen, probably going to, the suited for sure, is going to see bet, so the hearts, and I think they're going to see bet and check raise sometimes. So yeah, I think we can put pre- we we can condense him to a lot of seven x, eight x, some ace highs, maybe some sixes, and then uh, nines, tens, and jacks are like really really high frequency in there, and we do have 
the uh, King Five of Diamonds, King Five of Clubs blockers. So we have the Seven Five of Diamonds blocker if the flush comes, the Ace Five of Diamonds. So yeah, I think we we can just start betting and then continue on the river for like pot size shove a lot. Do you worry that you have a lot of straight draws here that are sort of sort of obvious um, in terms of like picking out bluff combos? Um, I like to use these pocket pairs in spots where I just don't have any cards that interact with this folding range, and I think that's more important. And then, yeah, I, I would, I do have a lot of those straight draws that I bet a lot less often and just mix all of them than I do with the hands that I think or had the best removal on his uh, bluff catching range, on his check call range. Like, I would like to take my suited aces here and just go for it. I'd like to take my twos through sixes and go for it. And then, you know, I think we're doing better to mix checking and betting with 9-10, jack-10, and our 5-6 is probably fine to just go for it as well. We like betting, like, the straight draws that are like inferior straight draws to get them to like when we bet five six and get a fold from nine ten here that's really sweet for us same thing with uh obviously getting the fold from jack ten where we actually complete a straight that busts us so i like to yeah four five five six my small pocket pairs my asex suited would be my primary bluffs here then the ones with some equity but yeah i think we're all right just because i don't think we ever have to worry about I don't think we have to worry too much about over bluffing there because our range is so condensed to begin with on this board versus that open that um, we have a good amount of leverage. Makes sense. All right, and this is our last hand we're taking a look at today. 10 7 in the big blind folds to us. I assume this is just a 100% call hand. Yeah, yeah, the thing about the people overdo the ICM thing with uh, against other big stacks, like, you're supposed to still defend very wide because you're supposed to at these depths even like you're not supposed to get get bluffed as often as people think and you can just go to showdown and you shouldn't tighten up as much as people do makes sense <clears throat> call decent flop um yeah we'd like to see him choose the big size here and just start forcing us to make the folds that have really good equity like just he should just bet like 80 percent, and then we have like Queen Jack of Clubs, and we just have to fold it. Um, so, but he does go with the small size versus the small size. We just pure check raise like 70% pot or whatever. Check raising the two pairs every time, and then, you know, I'm going to do my six fours. Seems simple. Um, and then on this turn, we're playing really polarized. Like, you don't fit in any of those blocks because all your good top pair check raises, like, some of them have those backdoor flush draws that are worth, you know, betting 80% pot or pot and are even like our jack 10 suited is good enough for pot. And we didn't check raise that linear that we need to put the block size in. And when we get such a brick turn, uh, we just go for the big size. I like it. Do you, uh, do you look to put this into your check range ever? Because sometimes it is nice to occasionally have some strong checks on the turn um, so that you know, it, and it's less it's less of a thing on uh, on a turn three, but as an example, on a turn like eight or six, where we can definitely have a bunch of hands that turn pairs, um, and might want to be checking, if we decide not to bluff with them, do you do you at all try and check some of these types of hands to protect those hands, or is that something that you're not really too concerned with? Uh, yeah, I like to for sure, um, but I think that we don't need to waste a hand that's so good. Uh, we can just do it with like something you know that that's going to make for a really good bluff catcher right like first of all yeah we can do it with like our ace 10 through jack 10 like on those turns where now we need less protection and we have some pretty decent um kickers that like we can make two pair on the river or we block his over pairs or whatever but for the most part yeah i think when we have two pair here we we probably don't want to waste it for like a check call for protection when we just have like king 10 would be completely fine to just check um if you wanted to mix in some strong tech checks i just wouldn't put in the two pairs makes sense <laughs> and i think this is a spot where i would have almost no traps i don't really see much yeah merit in having a trap range there's not really many missed hands that can even bluff uh the only thing that even really comes to mind is a hand maybe like 98 suited 
right uh, may, maybe 86 suited but and i mean outside we, of that yeah and we do have to bluff a bunch here so we got to make sure we go we get everything in with like our 10 7 our 7 5 totally agree um yeah and yeah the interesting hand the thing about this hand is he calls me with pretty much a pure fold uh so yeah i think you need you want to have like a 10 in your hand you want to have a six in your hand I have a bunch of six fours. I have ace four suited that backdoor flush draw or whatever. Like my ace four is probably a really prominent bluff on this flop and that gets there. The four six gets there. Um, bunch of sets and two pairs. So I think you need a little bit more than that. I think he's, you're supposed to call twice there for sure. And then you gotta, gotta lay it down in the river even with that two pair and set blocker. Yeah, well, if it gets to a point where, like, I have a set and two pair blocker, that's going to be a very large amount of hands when you just have a pair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I also just have, like, I still have to go for it. Like we were saying, like, I take this line with ace-10, king-10, queen-10 suited. So I don't think the seven is that big of a deal. Once we get to the river there and get that nice brick, we got to go for it, like we were saying, because we still have those jack nine eight nine hands are, are pretty high frequency for us some of those back jack eight backdoor flush draw types so i think we're gonna have like one pair there too so the two pair blocker might not necessarily be a huge huge deal too sounds good man so b yeah. before we go here do you want to talk a little bit about uh the the course that you created with us um maybe for people that potentially are interested in checking it out a little bit about the type of material you put out and just like uh, i guess just an overview of, of the course that you put together yeah for sure um basically what you can expect it's it's in three parts and it's a pre-flop section post-flop and play and explain in the pre-flop section i created um you know, I think it's like 250 charts, preflop charts that are uh, in pop-up format from 15 blinds to 100 blinds, and they cover raise first in, uh, calling versus opens, how, what to three bet, what to flat, and at what frequency, and that's verse from every position versus every position, uh, blind versus blind. That is basically the exact strategy that I play and that I see other super high roller regs play. That's just straight from the solver. Um, so it's a lot of stuff that I used uh, a lot of computer power and a lot of time to create that maybe people don't have, you know, the, the time or the resources to create. So all those ranges are, are from the solvers and, and they're I'm get, basically giving you a pre-flop playbook with that section, um, which I think is probably the most valuable part of the course for a lot of people. And then post-flop, I cover how to play in and in position and out of position, and uh, a lot of it is late position versus the blinds, because I know that's that's what a lot of people have told me that they struggle with the most. Um, but yeah, I cover single raise pots from both positions at a bunch of different stack depths and situations on, you know, like 10 or 15 types of boards. Um, it's a, that's all solver stuff. I'm explaining why I think the solver does what it does, how I study, how I build my ranges, how I build my sims. And the play and explain is just me going over hands uh, that I played from, you know, recent Scoop and W, Coop 5Ks, 10Ks. There's a um, full hand history of a 25K W Coop that I won. And there's some selected hands from the 1 million one drop where I just give insight on, how, you know, hands I played versus some of the best regulars um, where I think I made mistakes or what I think I should have done differently. So yeah, I think there's a lot to be gained from pretty much anyone, you know, can, can learn something from it. I learned a ton just making it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I really did. So I mean, yeah. It was yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you're saying. Cause I, I made a course too. And, and or, not just that, but having coached a lot of people, sometimes the best way to learn is, is by like putting your thoughts, uh, you know, telling your thoughts to other people and having to explain why and, and, and helps you kind of understand um, your positions more fully and, and, and also you, you can learn from it too. Uh, also, by the way, guys, if you sign up uh, today, you'll get a $300 course for free. We're going to start selling that for $300 starting tomorrow. Uh, it's an ICM course you created. Nick, do you want to talk a little bit about that too? Yeah, um, I think actually this video is a, we actually got into talking a little bit about the type of stuff I cover in the ICM section of the course, uh, talking about the implications of different stack distributions, uh, how those stack distributions um, you know, affect post-flop strategy, 
and also mostly like I touched on a little bit today when we were talking, but uh, the ICM model just has a lot of limitations and just following Hold'em resources or what you read on the forums or, you know, a lot of people talking about you know, ICM in a very rigid way, I think it's a huge mistake. So I kind of highlight the pros and cons of the model and what to be careful about and, you know, how you can use some additional knowledge to maybe find some exploits at final tables and finish top three more often. Awesome. Sounds great. And before we go here, uh, you know, for people who maybe can't afford the course, but, but you know, they, they learn a lot from hearing you today. Do you have any just like general advice for people playing tournaments, some mistakes you really commonly see that people could look to try and improve in their own play? Uh, that's a tough question. I think that in general, there's a lot of tightness in big pots in tournaments uh, for some of the reasons we talked about today. And uh, maybe people should focus more on not making mistakes and just trying to make good decisions and just deal with it later. You know, don't be too, don't be too emotional. So, okay. don't don't be a nit as well is, is kind of what you're hinting at <laughs> awesome man well i appreciate you taking the time to stop by and uh make some content here on my channel and uh for you guys if you're interested in learning more about nick's course i'll put a link in the description below uh over to upswing you can check it out all right man thanks very thanks. much thanks a lot all right sounds good peace guys thank you for joining us